So we have a lot of migrants. We have a um, wide range of, of cultural expressions. Uh, people are identified as Quechua and also um, Aymara and Chilean Afro descendants. Here we have some background. In this area, uh, we had um, everything that we know from uh, the colonization. Um, we had here a part of the Spanish crown. And what brings me here with this presentation Um, is that the, the work, the, the land was very highly worked, um, specifically with seeds that were in the area. The uh, Azapa Valley, located at five kilometers from Arica, the city, is very rich, rich in water. Um, it's a valley that is recognized uh, for its agriculture and its uh, agriculture work. And what the Spaniards did when they invaded um, the zone was to begin working the land and starting working um, and well paying tribute uh, to, the, to the indigenous peoples that were in the area. And when they saw that they could not do longer with them, they enslaved, um, African people, and these are now the ones um, that are recognized as Afro-Chileans uh, ascendants. So they dedicated mostly to the uh, plantation of cotton, also sugarcane, as we can see in the images. We also uh, see it through the photographies that um, have to do with the agriculture uh, taking place within this area. And we also, um, some history. So uh, we have a period called Chilenization that started from Arica, which was a process uh, really difficult and indicates a little bit um, and, and explain why there is so much ignorance about the Afro-Chilean uh, descendants. Uh, because there was a huge uh, whitening process. Um, the people from from Peru um, were black, but this is uh, this is not really uh, spoken about. However, we know the Afro-Chilean uh, descendants because of the uh, claim movements, the establishment of the indigenous law, and the um, 169 ILO Convention, and the rights of the indigenous peoples were not recognized till 2019. I'm going to speak now about a religious practice called uh, Cruz de Mayo, or Cross of May. Uh, we cannot really uh, establish uh, the origin, nor is my purpose. We understand it's a syncretism between uh, Catholic aspects and indigenous aspects, as well as Afro-descendants. But uh, the important uh, part of this uh, celebration, this practice, this ritual, is that as you can see through this picture, we have the valley. Uh, let's say uh, in 2014, uh, that's the picture, uh, that's when, when the picture was taken. And so the Azapa Valley was uh, invaded, let's say by the um, seed growers, by industrial seed growers that are affecting the local production uh, of the indigenous people's agriculture, and also to the ritual practices, because um, Cruz de Mayo is celebrated at the top of the hill, and these uh, industrial seed growers are taking these hills, these spaces, and so the Afro descendants no longer have a place to celebrate their festivity. Here is one of the few studies that were carried out on this topic by Corvato, Diaz, Muñoz, and Mondaca. You can see here, we have a lot of uh, the same uh, festivities. They are not only performed by uh, Afro-Chilean descendants, 
but we we also have uh, Aymara communities that are uh, celebrating the the Cruz de Mayo and identify the, the themselves as Afro-Chilean. This is my theoretical framework. I will not go deep into this, but I I do want to recognize the uh, identity dynamics. Uh, talking about territory and ancestrality, that I think is very related um, to this topic of violence within the territories and how it can affect the dynamics of the indigenous peoples in habitating the areas. And here you can see as well a picture taken by, by the uh, people that were collaborating with my master thesis, because uh, within uh, the methodology, it was a qualitative investigation with a field investigation. And I used a collaborative approach as well when um, the community itself wrote some experiences and sent me pictures that they, they took. They took, sorry. So uh, written texts that they sent were biographical um, narratives and they mostly speak about how the Azapa Valley is being invaded and how it is affecting um, the practice, their practices and the agriculture uh, as they are an agrarian community. So one of the activities that we did a long time ago in 2015, we developed a talking map when we uh, put together three generations elders, adults, and the youth. So they uh, created this uh, map of the Asapa Valley, and it was incredible how the elders were able to recognize every sector. They were all able to put an indicator in every cross, and the youth were uh, marking, were indicating mostly the these uh, industrial seed growers. So uh, Cruz de Mayo or Cross of May consists in going uh, to the top of the hill, uh, worship the, the cross, and then going back to the city because the cross uh, takes care of, of the farm that the people have where they cultivate and, and, they, uh, and they gather their products so they can have a very good next year. So I'm gonna show here uh, a little bit of a video documentary that uh, we did with some colleagues. And uh, what I wanted to show is Cómo ha ido cambiando el Valle de Azapa y cómo ha afectado en sus propias prácticas rituales de las comunidades. Mi abuelita hacía el altar con sauce. En este momento no hay sauce acá en el valle. Solamente en una parte nomás. Hace... My grandma made an altar. They put fruits on it. All the fruits from our garden. My granny would put bananas, orange, mango, pacay, and other fruits. Nowadays, how we are living, we do not have water, we do not have fruit, trees. As you can hear in this recording, the celebration is carried out differently from how it was made before. They don't have different fruits available anymore. In this sense, this also happens with indigenous population. It is a celebration celebrated by the complete community of Valle de Azapa. Everyone celebrates it. It's very important for them in the relationship with the tree tree. So having these difficulties and these changes makes it different. In all the tellings that we have, all the stories that we have heard with this job, one 
of the things that call my attention the most is cre the creation of these communities, Andean communities, Afro-Andean communities. They are claiming and asking for land to national goods. Many of them to be able to go to the hill and visit their crosses. They have to ask for permission to the seat beds. And we can see here this recognition of the territoriality that exists in the Asapa Valley with all the Afro-Andean community, including different religion places. And we can also button these different dynamics here to defend also the territory that is very important for this festivity to continue through time. Because if this polarization continues, what is happening right now in the Azapa Valley with the big beds that are not only affecting to the population, they are also affecting the valley. It is completely dry. There is no water. And there are also pests. So the olives are dying, the olive trees are dying. So we have to decolonize these spaces. And we have also to understand that Cristo de la Cruz, the cross, Chris, have these different aspects, economical, social, cultural aspects intertwined. This activity is not only about a religious belief, but about social and familiar dynamics that have been passed through generations. And these reciprocities are very important so they can give to the make for us all the things that they receive from the land. Many of the people live in the valley. Many they have left the city. There are many conflicts, economical, political conflicts. Here you can see a picture of my granny. My granny is there. For example, she had her cross in the hill. And now, as you can see, there is a greenhouse there now, so she can no longer go to her cross. So this procession and this hard work and the, um, the celebration to the curse to go that and do that, she has to go to the hill, but she cannot make it. And national kids gave her a territory so she could give, uh, he could use it for as a baron, some sort of barn. And now they have to take the cross off and bring it down, which is kind of illogical. So here, regarding the results, we see this Cruz de Mayo as an identity and self-recognition practice. We have also territory and nature, which are a key aspect of all the violence that the community is facing in the Asapa Valley itself, in the agriculture, in the seed bed, this is there. And there are also some symbols and subjectivities intertwined more than these religious aspects. These links are also related to what's considered sacred. 
we also see consequences in the ritual. Joint family within this practice means that the older people teach younger people. So with this, we are also affecting the identity of the group. That would be it for me. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop share. Thank you. Gracias, Nicole. Ahora vamos a pasar a Oscar Rodríguez con su ponencia del conflicto Thank agrario. You, Nicole. We're going now with Oscar Rodríguez with his presentation about the agrarian conflict and land disputes in the indigenous territories of Oaxaca. Can we please present? Show the presentation, please. It is on. Okay. Okay, I'm going to find the way. Okay, let's introduce this. When you read this document and are able to join the network to a smartphone or a computer, I invite you to search for Conflicto Agrario en Oaxaca. Oaxaca conflict. So see the news. You will see that in the different results, some of them are from years ago. If you're curious and you start reading, you will realize that the results are disputes, all disputes in the land. Oaxaca has been crucial to the formation of the territory in Mexico from the arrival to the Spaniards on. There are a lot of literature regarding the context in which these disputes are. We have also documents from the state which are both colonial and Republican try to give answers to the different claims. I'm going to tell you about recent cases so we can see the need and the urgency of the land conflict in Oaxaca. I'm also going to talk a bit about the role of the state. This is the first part of the presentation from word to action. From the presidents of the Republic, Oaxaca is part of the national agenda in different spaces in what is called La Mañanera, who was candidate back then, Andres Manuel López Obrador, in 2015, who is nowadays the president of Mexico. He declared in on 15 February 2012, he said that he would be the guardian of the indigenous quote. So with that, he made a commitment to protect this, but he has been advocating, let's say, for private property. In the first months after the start of his position as president, he went to the indigenous peoples looking for a signature to make a peace agreement. And he said, we're going to unite, nothing of hate, nothing of hard feelings. 
We have to forgive each other. We have to hug each other and being fraternal and humane. It is worth to ask what's behind this. What's the importance of the agrarian conflicts? What's the reality of the communities? Have we had a positive impact of the President López Obrador in the region? The Oaxaca question, uh, the Oaxaca issue in the media is not widely covered. And we have a lot of situations also with authorities. Let's think of Ayutla Tama Salpam and San Pedro in San Pablo, Utah. In Oaxaca, do you remember the, the problem, the water problem that we have, that we had with the spring? From Rompeviento. Ernesto Levesma is the name of a colleague that is inviting me uh, to be at the signing of a legal treaty. Ayutla Mije is, is the name. I was invited already for, for me to be a witness. Because they made peace in Oaxaca, we addressed this topic several times, and I'm very happy. I celebrated. I sent a big hug to all the mijes of that region of Oaxaca. I think this is a very good example. I did not go to this signing. Uh, I was being invited to, 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 to sign as a witness of a treaty. Uh, I thought it was very good, but it was too good. Uh, I thought it, it might be better to, to wait. But now that you're uh, denouncing, I think that I, I, I did a good job by not going. Uh, I was told that it was sold. But this issue is um, already calling for the authorities. But if there's not consensus, if there's discontent, we need to try to find uh, an agreement. Even when there were good intentions, the federal government, the conglomerate of indigenous peoples um, did, did not overlook the government. They declared that this government follows the logics of the previous ones regarding the conquer. They do not recognize our collective rights or self-determination is not recognized. They um, make like they respect them in the Yucatan Peninsula. They use the military and the public force and they're still overlapping the organized crime to kill and make uh, a, a fear and to establish fear within the community. They try to pass over our assemblies, our organizations, ourselves. 
and the people of San Mateo del Mar when we're still um, waiting for justice. We do not trust in the authority and it's based on its actions. It is horrible to see uh, the, the action of the state. The human rights um, defendant uh, started an investigation for the Santo Domingo Iscatlan uh, case where a thousand and three hundred farmers were killed to be dispossessed of their lands. How can we explain the participation of local um, state and, and regional institutions within uh, these uh, issues? This, of course, does not respect the right of uh, legal security and, of course, the land right and the right to enjoy their indigenous land. So we now need to see uh, what was the place of the human rights defender through the Transparency uh, Institute? We initiated a question in 2021 where I asked to know how many cases of Oaxaca are they actually investigated. Surprisingly, since its uh, foundation, in 1993, they only started 26 and only 10 from 2014, seven were initiated. When it comes to um, question and answers, we can address the, the process of the institution and they excuse themselves saying that they have emitted uh, early warnings for the case of Santiago Testiclan and some other regional and local processes. Secondly, we have uh, the state communities and the agrarian conflict. So 2021, was uh, the uh, 30th anniversary of the um, Agrarian Conciliation Group under the state management, so as to manage the conflict between um, communities disputing between themselves. Regarding this, they received more than 300 conflicts regarding the land and the president of the institution. To the date, they sold 53 of these 364 demands that they inherited from uh, the previous governments. The situation is very critical if we consider that the state of Oaxaca is formed by 570 um, municipalities, thousands of thousands of land and linear matters um, are regarded as lands in dispute and the agreements are good for 50,000 people uh, within the entity, but we really need to uh, ask if um, people were actually benefited from uh, these actions, did the state actually did something to uh, ameliorate the disputes between the communities? Unfortunately, when we speak about the state, it's like a swamp. Uh, at the end of uh, September 2021, it was announced a peace treaty uh, between uh, local, between state uh, workers and the community. There were many entities, uh, as for example, uh, of uh, human rights and environmental uh, institutions that were dealing uh, within this treaty that also address um, older conflicts. This is uh, this historical process 
at the at the very end finally fell apart afterwards in the news appeared a, a simulation um, the the treaty was questioned when a drone unknowingly driven recorded when armed subjects attacked the house of a municipal worker who was killed and his house burned. This was a killing that was recorded and transmitted uh, on a live television. And the newspapers um, asked, did the peace treaty was successful? And they answered no. We saw a killing and we suppose there's not responsible or no one to be held responsible. So the treaty was about um, a compromise between the two communities of not carrying out no act of violence. Until the day, the conflict is still unsolved. So we see fragility and a lack of compromise when it comes to these treaties that is also linked with the lack of recognition of these communities. So I ask, is there something to celebrate about the resolution that came out in 2021 by the Supreme Court regarding the conflict in the uh, Chimalapa zone? Today, I'm informing that the Supreme Court of Justice has enacted the first interstate decision about a conflict that includes many tears and it has decided in favor of Oaxaca. So we get back that signification of the indigenous peoples that live in Chimalapas and Oaxaca. In Oaxaca. A third point, I want to inform you that as this Supreme Court states, we will create in tables, we would create in groups to listen to the population in the region and their needs. And we will also be there creating a group, a working group to create dialogue and peace in our brother state Chiapas. With these Oaxaqueños, we are getting our territory back. And with our head up, I can tell you long live Oaxaca, viva Oaxaca. Corte de Justicia determinó que la región de los Chimalapas, de más de 160.000. The Court of Justice determined that this place belongs to Oaxaca and not Chiapas. The reactions of the community, many of them deny to be from Oaxaca, and there is a possibility for them to be a free municipality and there will be also access to basic services. At least 16 communities in Chiapas are armed now to defend their land. They created a community guard and they are working. In our process, the communities have decided to not let others take our land away. 
se requiere transitar del paradigma jurídico tradicional a uno que privilegie la cultura de paz para propiciar peritajes tanto antropológicos como históricos we para want a culture of peace we need to find the causes that have created this to conclude Nowadays, there are a lot of questions that need an answer. I don't have the answers, but it seems like the agrarian conflict does not have a way out. The authority in charge of mediating, they must proceed. We have had solution of only 15% of agrarian conflict. It is clear that besides the corruption, violence amplify the impact of agrarian conflicts that in extreme cases mean the displacement of indigenous communities. Until now, the guardian of this Oaxacanian land hasn't given an answer regarding this. We do not see a change of paradigm so far. There is a lot of violence that is increasing. I don't want to give you the sense that this is something that doesn't have a solution. I just want to emphasize how complex it has been historically. And I make a call on for the dialogue from our different spaces and consider the loss of human lives. Lastly, I, I want to thank the organization committee for allowing me to share all of these ideas. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Oscar. Thank you very much, Oscar. So now we will have. Oh, she's not available. The next presentation, she's not there. Pasamos a la. Ya. So. Then, Oscar, we will uh, set the table, the discussion table. Eh, bueno, ahora vamos a pasar al espacio de preguntas. Well, tanto para... so now we will go to the uh, questions uh, allocated at time. As for Nicole and Oscar, I had a question for Nicole. I have it here written. Yes, so um, it was not very clear to me. Um, what do you mean uh, that this is um, recognized by law as an Afro-Chilean uh, tribal uh, indigenous people? What does it have to do with the uh, um, problematic with the state? Should I answer uh, right now? Yes, okay. So um, in 2019, we had the 20,151 law that recognized the Afro-Chilean descent people. Um, we use uh, the, the word tribal 
as the 169 ILO Convention recognizes, even when we should not uh, use this term. And this recognition uh, implies the legal recognition of this uh, tribal Afro-descendant um, people, uh, as well as their culture, cosmovision, and practices in the northern Chile. We are understand, they are understood, sorry, as um, a group uh, descending from the uh, transatlantic uh, people trade, and they are recognized as well as the heritage uh, material and in matter and in material of the country where their um, traditional knowledge um, and language is rec recognized, even though it does not uh, exist anymore. Um, their festivities and rituals as well, for example, the, the Cruz de Mayo, and that, that sh they should be promoted by the state as recognized as uh, heritage. So uh, one thing that is still bothering me is that this article uh, by the law is not uh, being enforced because um, this uh, cultural heritage material and immaterial is not uh, being respected uh, regarding the Cruz de Mayo festivity. And uh, actually after, after the law, nothing has happened during the Piñera government. They, they were not uh, recognized so as to be part of the constitutional uh, process that they should have had. Um, it should have been a space for them uh, as part of the recognition of the states. And something that has not uh, happened yet is to have a statistical notion of how many people Afro-descendants are in Chile because um, the only thing that was done was a um, Afro characterization survey during 2013 that showed that 5% of the Arika population uh, recognized uh, themselves as Afro descendant. So um, till now we don't have any uh, any survey. Um, maybe we should have it uh, with the next census. I don't know when will it happen, but they should be considered within it so we can have and a statistical uh, notion of how many people self-recognize as uh, Afro-Chilean. I don't know if I answered your question, but within these laws uh, promoted by the state, uh, of course, the law in particular uh, has not been respected at all. I'm investigating um, education because one of our uh, one of the articles within the law is that it should be promoted within schools um, primary education and secondary education, and, and as well, uh, university education, that um, we, we should have a uh, teaching of, of the knowledge and the history of this population, so as to say that, uh, so as to stop saying that in Chile that are not uh, Afro people, and to start invisibilizing this, this part of the population. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Muchas gracias, Nicole. Eh, dejo abierto la palabra por si alguien quiere hacer algún comentario o alguna pregunta a los expositores. Thank you, Nicole. ¿Se escucha? Sí. Eh, bueno, uno continuando a una pregunta, Nicole, y tengo un par de preguntas también a Oscar. Eh, bueno, agradecerles por sus presentaciones muy interesantes, ambas. Eh, a Nicole, continuando. Thank you for your interesting presentations. Continuing with that law from 2019, I understand the Afro-descendant people was part of the indigenous law. So they have a legal recognition in a new law but it's kind of symbolic because they cannot get anything from the indigenous law. Do you know if there is a specific process to be part of the indigenous law? That's for Nicole and for Oscar. 
I also have a question regarding Hidal property and this legal conflict that you mentioned that had a solution in last year. There were people from Oaxaca. They were represented as indigenous people or as a community or was the state the one who represented the parts of this conflict? Please, Nicole. It has been a huge struggle from the year 2000 that started the Afro-descendant movement in Chile. It started in Santiago because there was a pre-conference about racism. We had the president Lagos back then and there was a group from Arica recognized as, as Afro-descendant. This Chilenization period eliminated them with the aim of improving the race. So many of these Afro-descendants lost blackness and their physical characteristics. We have people who are not from abroad who are Chilean and that consider themselves as black. And they ask Laos if the, is there Afro-descendants in Chile? He says, no. And the people say, how is it that there is not Afro-descendants in Chile, we are here, we exist. And then 2030 activist organization, also musicians, Kumbe is the traditional dance that Afro-descendants have. All of these are not recognized in indigenous people. They cannot be recognized under the indigenous people because what this indigenous law ask is that they have a tongue, a language. And they don't have a specific language because these people arrived here forced. They were brought by force, so they don't have a, their own language. But they do have other elements that are part of the uh, requisites of the legal, the indigenous law. So we have the case of the Tango people and the Ayitas people. And this recognition of tribal, of this law of the tribal recognition, which is related to the ILO government in the constitution of the 80, these peoples are recognized, but the only ones that are recognized now in the tribal law are the Afro-descendant groups. <laughs> so this has brought a lot of struggle, a lot of fights within the communities, between the communities, especially in the north, because Afro would fight with Quechua and Aymara. And right now they are trying to leave those conflicts behind and fighting together. Because many of the people who recognize themselves as Afro-descendant have the recognition of Konadi as Quechua or as Aymara. So we have this intersection. Many people are recognizing themselves now as Afro-Andean. So that's one of the challenges that we have for the next census. Who are going to recognize as Afro, as Afro-Andean? How are we going to do not only with the Haitian migrants that we have now in Chile, so there we have this challenge and this mystery of who 
are going to be this Afro descendants in Chile if it's going to depend on each person's self determination or if they're going to need something else as language. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but it's a very, very interesting topic that we hadn't been able to, to address because the new constitution didn't address it as well. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias por la pregunta. Eh, to ask her so that, that he can uh, answer. Um, yes, uh, regarding representation, this is what I was trying to port portray through the videos. Um, as soon as the as the the uh, Supreme Court ruled against the communities, uh, they arose, of course, um, because the sense that they have been um, carrying out uh, for defending their boundaries because of course we're speaking about two states um the logic that the, the state is applying and uh it, it it's it, it has to do with that the, the government is still not recognizing the indigenous communities and of course this is where the violence arises we we need to know um the land the territory and i swear that uh, the people who's taking care of this uh, issues uh, do not know the communities and of course for them uh, public workers is to call uh, people to to the capital and in an analysis that i'm uh, actually developing um is uh, checking who is actually working um with uh, within these institutions and i've been surprised because the institution uh, specifically created for um the uh, for addressing uh, this issue should um, give results, uh, should give some outcomes. There are there are professionals there that should, of course, understand the, the issues and the problematics within the communities. And we, we don't have this. So um, the community does not recognize us as um, part of the Oaxaca region. And, and so who can give us light of uh, their identity? Of course, an anthropologist. But um, we cannot um, force the, the practitioners um, to, to carry out a certain uh, researches. But um, is of course um, the, the duty of the conflict parts uh, to share their information so as to solve the problem. So this is why I wanted to, to uh, show this um, issue, because from the state, they don't really have a notion that they didn't even consider uh, as part of the Oaxaca state. And and it's, it's very incredible that uh, the state workers um, are, are searching the easy way. So um, the ruling, came out uh, on Friday, and then on Monday, next Monday, um, the news told that the, the people there did not feel as Oaxacans. So uh, these videos um, are very contradictory, and this is because the institutions, local institutions, um, have um, made a very difficult process uh, including the president, because there's not uh, a solution for this problem. And what do I mean by an, an effective solution? Uh, the, the, the role of institutions uh, regarding uh, the case of Oaxaca and the Human Rights Ombudsman uh, Office should be a key institutions. Of course, in uh, specific terms, when we're speaking uh, about these areas of, of human rights. And I have uh, identified uh, various institutions, for example, within the uh, general state uh, secretary, we have a human rights ombudsman office, but why if there is already uh, an office dedicated to, to this? Uh, I had a colleague and I will not say her name, but I asked her, uh, what does uh, the institution uh, that um, takes care 
of 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 the of the victims that suffer these problems and she didn't know what they were doing so we we have these uh, very blurry institutions and the role of institutions and i think this is um a very sensitive uh, topic and we we should take a look at this systemic racism because it is not um or role to represent them as uh, as indigenous peoples in dispute or local communities in dispute. I have seen my own that um, the peoples do not trust the institutions. And I think uh, this is, is happening in Chile as well. But at, at least in Mexico, we have agrarian courts. And they have had, uh, of course, a lot of uh, of, of demands because uh, they are corrupt, that the ruling are unfair. And I will say this very briefly. When I was trying to investigate uh, about a process um, going uh, going on in a, in a community with, that was very close to the city, I, I went to investigate uh, a file from 2019 I wanted to consult it because they are public and the the and the people there should uh, told me that I could not uh, access them and of course I, I I said okay I will not discuss with him so I complained for them to give me uh, the, the file and they said, uh, how weren't you able to, to consult this file? And uh, therefore we can see uh, how the institutions are not working the way they should, but yes, uh, the way the state want them to, to, to function. And this level of um, not knowledge of the communities uh, regarding this agrarian uh, conflict are all uh, put together within this Oaxacan conflict, of course. Um, the figure of the ejido is um, communitary property. And in Oaxaca, this uh, common property, uh, we would we'd have it on top of the cake, let's say, for those who want to privatize land. Because all of these conflicts that emerge um, come from this demand of, of, of privatizing land, uh, mining companies, are they interested? Um, agrarian exploitation is there, of course. And when uh, the communities are offered money or um, they become vulnerable because of the appropriation of lands of uh, neighboring communities, that's where conflicts emerge as well. So the clash that I was mentioning at the very beginning between this uh, community, community property and private pro property, uh, we see we see this uh, very particular uh, property that is um, elegido. Is there any other question by the public? Muchas gracias. Eh, sí, quería hacer como una pregunta, un poco comentario. Thank you very much. Porque, eh, yes, digamos, I want to make a question or comment to both of you. Eh, we have this complex for land, and this is a very specific topic. There are some claims, some demands for indigenous land. So we're thinking about the nationality of the indigenous peoples, nationalities or contemporary nationalities are different. We have different nationalities in both. With the videos that you showed, Oscar, I was thinking about the claim of the indigenous nationalisms that start to appear in the community in Chiapas. Thinking of 
the self-determination as a way to defend territories. And I was also thinking of the work of Nicole, Nicole's work, because Clifford talks about the diaspora and how they are linked to offer descendants. And they are so useful now to think about these processes, intercultural processes as well. The idea of not having territories and arriving to a specific place and from there to make collective claims is something that I see as related to your work. And I wanted to ask you if these self-determination processes are also considered as a total autonomy in nation states. Okay, it's going to answer Nicole first and then Osta. It is a difficult question. I think that one of the proposals of the new constitution was that Chile were, would be a plurinational country. I don't know in detail what the Aymara community want in the specific territory of Arica in the north of Chile. For the dear to the indigenous law, they have a lot of rights, but also a lot of obligations. And they belong to a place that is not recognized by the state. So the state thinks that magically they didn't pass by Arica y Paridacota, so they can even identify as an indigenous association. And that's a problem because many people in the region identify as Quechua. They have a flag now as an indigenous people in Arica and the Azapa Valley. I don't think that the expectation is to separate from the state, but they do want recognition they want the legal rights that the other indigenous peoples have. No, I don't remember the other part of the question. Okay, the diaspora, it was about the diaspora. I think it is very interesting. In fact, I'm now addressing this topic in my PhD thesis, how diasporas can help building identities well, I'm an anthropologist. I don't know if I mentioned that. I'm a sociologist as well. So I work with this identities and the Afro-Andean concept. Although a lot of people recognize themselves now as Afro, they also have indigenous ancestors and how the limits of these categories can limit identities. So I use the term of identitary dynamics more than identity. Everything transforms in time depending on the context. And in this case now, the Afro-Indigenous population in the country, I don't have any statistics on this, but I can affirm that it's a lot more than the last census in 2013, where we were talking about the Afro descendants in Chile that in the survey didn't recognize as Aymara, but now they do recognize this factor. Thank you, Nicole. We will go now with Oscar. 
In fact, the question is very interesting because we haven't put that much attention there in the formation of Oaxaca. This comes from the colonial times and then after that in the state conception. So we have this different agrarian conflicts that have been happening in Oaxaca from the colonial time. So the colonial state arrived to the Central Valley in Oaxaca and the conflict started. And what happened defining this? Short ago, we were talking about the interior of this legal aspects. So here we have a different kind of encounter with sacred spaces like the hill or some specific geographical spaces limited with, by trees. How can I say that my house is in the third tree in the fourth hill? And how can I make a code for this? Indigenous communities in Oaxaca, from what I've seen, nobody has documented this. So in Mexico, there is a tradition, Mapas de Xatoyan. Those are a series of maps that were created trying to, to lie to the courts using the legislation. So they were thinking, if you want me to change my own legal systems to yours, okay, I'm going to do it. But for us as historian, this is very interesting, the topic of legality. On the other hand, in Mexico, in the agrarian courts, as I was telling you, there is a vast tradition of polygraphic analysis. And in that analysis, they identify the strategies of the peoples, all the strategies that they have presented to the courts, and they present narratives where they state that they are descendants of Hernando Cortes. So what the indigenous communities do is to try to do this. The colonial state was beneficial to the indigenous communities in this cultural aspect. So all of this traditional, this colonial tradition in the 19th century change with this court when change everything around it. After that, there were some new background information looking for the territorial reivindication. All of these documents raise this question, who is the beneficiary of this and who gets the worst part of it? And we are not limiting the topic of property. So that's where the conflicts are. Um, the army has entered to limit the, the land, but communities have never been included from the colonial times. This system was there, and these traditions are there from the colonial times. So they saw this territory and they based on that to progress in this modernity, we should maybe do that. 
but it's not being carried out. Eh, no sé si quedará alguna pregunta del público. Thank you very much, Oscar. I don't know if somebody from the public has any question. Something uh, very short about uh, uh, Nicole's presentation uh, was related with something you were asked uh, about. Um, this uh, after descendant climb, there is uh, nothing um, about the, the terri about a territorial climb, but uh, I think it does have a very uh, strong territorial aspect, and and so uh, in which in, in I mean I, I know I know um, land climb I, I I see it here because they they cannot uh, access the the hill. Uh, that I institutionalize, institutionalize as part of my culture and my and my practice, and uh, these seed companies are taking that land away. So, how is this not a part of, of the discussion? Maybe not a, a, a claim itself, but about a, a discussion of this a more spatial uh, claim. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, the seed uh, companies in the north of Chile is just like forestry companies in the south that are, are taking away the land from, from people um, to to grow and, and to gather. Uh, even when they do not have um, an origin, a, a territory of origin, even though they, they, they came to Chile, um, the Azapa Valley is divided uh, in, in kilometers. So Afro, descent, uh, Afro descendants always say that they were between the first kilometer and the 20th kilometer, and they claim this as uh, its land, that they work this land, and they were uh, eventually acquiring uh, territories because uh, some landowners were giving them lands or uh, other processes. But they say uh, this is their land of origin, um, they also say that from uh, kilometer 21 and on, um, there were the indigenous people. So uh, the majority of people within the Asapa Valley, they were uh, purely uh, from the Asapa. They were the brunette of Asapa, let's say, because uh, they are Afro descendants. That are that are now uh, using the word Afro, but um, the Asapa Valley before um, at the at the time being brunette meant to be Afro descendants. So I I think that the territory is constructed by all the all the uh, conceptions of the world that uh, build reality, and of course with this uh, celebration of the Cruz de Mayo. They, they took uh, some uh, practices of the daily life. And I think it is very important to see how that relation between the ontology of these two um, peoples, let's say the interaction and the connection between these two peoples and the way they practice their rituals that transforms and, and experiments within this uh, concrete space that is the Asapa Valley, I think is very relevant uh, the, the hills itself are very relevant as uh, a distinctive uh, aspect of the landscape. That uh, when, when you ask, they, they only uh, say, no, those are uh, the crosses. Like it, it was very normal. Like there were geo symbols of the Asapa Valley that incorporate uh, as well uses and practices, uh, ritual practices and also spaces and histories uh, of the communities that inhabit the, the place. And I think um, they also relate with the cultural landscape that is taking place in the Asapa Valley with these uh, sacred hills that have a, a component um, re in relationship with the ancestors of well, as well. So we, we we have this this line of uh, Marisol de la Cadena, uh, an author, um, 
when she speaks about this relation not only with the land but with objects with animals uh, with the death uh, with the dead as well because uh, here in the crosses they, they put pictures of, of the uh, dead people and this is as well a, a social religious context that is shared and that indicates a spatial territory that shapes uh, the identity of the groups that, uh, of course, celebrate this, this festivity. And uh, regarding the interviews that I, that I carried out, um, they sang to the cross. And, and here uh, within the festivity, you, you see very much uh, it, it repeats um, this topic about the, the beings, uh, the land, uh, animals and this relation with the territory. So I think uh, Cruz de Mayo is really a symbol of this uh, landscape, of, of this common landscape of the community that for me uh, was was only wood. Uh, but now it, of course, means uh, something uh, very important and transcendental for my own life. Uh, that is part of this landscape, this territory, and that makes the, the uh, Cruz of uh, Cruz de Mayo as something very territorial that builds this uh, economical, social, and spiritual um, context. And when we speak about these uh, social and even environmental changes coming from the seed companies, uh, water scarcity, they uh, they have also altered uh, the water courses of the Azapa Valley. Uh, this ancestral landscape, as well as the olive oil, uh, because uh, the Asapa Valley was known for it, uh, for its olive oil. Uh, now we don't have it anymore. And that was a symbol of what the enslaved in the area um, were doing. So I think, of course, the territory is very important uh, to this practice of Cruz de Mayo that has to do with the work of land, um, harvesting, uh, and of course, familiar, um, uh, the, the families were dedicated to this uh, agrarian production. They dedicated their lives, uh, their whole lives uh, to do this and they cannot do it anymore. So taking the, the context, uh, the concept of uh, deterritorialize, I think there is not a deterritorialization uh, in this case. I think uh, it is um, actually about um, the territory is part, it's, uh, it's a key part of, of the uh, dynamic uh, systems of uh, self-identification for these communities. Recalling Games and Kubaker and Lodeman, for example, uh, these communities are in constant uh, flexibility and changement. Um, where they inhabit between uh, the different communities and they are well related between indigenous Afro-descendants. Um, that's it. Thank you. Your, your question was very interesting. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Nicole and Oscar. I think we will uh, close this discussion group. I will thank uh, everyone that is here um, today and I will invite you for the afternoon uh, sessions for uh, another discussion group and video documentaries beginning at uh, 3 p.m. And we will continue after the lunch break. At 4.30, we will have the video documentaries. Thank you very much. Bye.